Welcome everybody, and thank you for joining us for this panel, which is looking at Africa's digital infrastructure, why the cloud, cables, and affordable connectivity are critical for Pan-African growth, integration, consumers, and innovation. My name is Boko Nyundo. I'm a business development professional at the law, law firm DLA Piper. Um, I'm delighted for this panel to be joined by a group of eminent speakers, starting with Dr. Ahmedin Mohamed Ahmed, who is the State Minister for ICT and Digital Transformation Sector for the Government of Ethiopia. I'm also delighted to be joined by Mariam Abdullahi, Director, Android Platform Partnerships at Google. I'm also delighted to be joined by Ben Roberts, who's Group Chief Technology and Innovation Officer at Liquid Telecom. And finally, I'm joined by my colleague, Mike Conradi, who's a partner at DLA Piper. If I could encourage you over the course of this panel to please put your questions through the chat function, that'd be enormously helpful, as we'll take those questions on an ongoing basis, but principally at the end of the panel. Um, so at the top right of your screen is chat function, and through that, you can leave your questions. If I could ask each individual panelist to just give us some context for what they do uh, for the benefit of our audience today. And I'm going to start with Dr. Ahmedin, if I may. Dr. Ahmedin, please let the audience know who you are and what you do before we get into the conversation between us uh, for this panel. Dr. Ahmedin, I think you may need to unmute yourself. Okay, for now, we're going to go across to Mariam until we can uh, resolve the audio issue that the minister's currently having. Mariam, please introduce yourself. So thank you, Boko. Don't we all love uh, technology issues sometimes? <laughs> <laughs> so hi, everyone. Delighted to be here with you this afternoon. I'm Mariam Abdullahi, as uh, Boko has said. I, I work at Google. Um, I'm based out of Kenya, but I cover the continent of Africa where I lead our Android platform partnerships program um, across the continent of Africa. Thank you, Mariam. And uh, Ben, if you could kindly introduce yourself. Uh, hi, yeah, I'm, I'm Ben Roberts. Um, I'm also uh, sitting in Kenya today, um, um, which is why I stay. Uh, I work for Liquid Telecom and I'm, I'm Chief of Technology and Innovation at Liquid Telecom. I'm really focused on um, our, you know, the things we're doing next uh, in terms of uh, new products, new technologies, and uh, and how we uh, use that across the infrastructure that we've built across Africa. Thank you, Ben. Um, next, if we could go to Mike. Uh, Mike is my colleague. I know him well. Um, and by the way, whilst we're uh, we've got both DNA Piper folk talking to you in the audience. Do note that you can join us in the exhibition space uh, at any time over the course of the next couple of days. And to do that, you just need to go into the people section of the portal and suggest a meeting with any uh, of our DNA Piper team. But Mike, a bit of context for the audience for you, what you do. Thanks, Boko. Um, so my name is Mike Conradi. I am a partner at DLA Piper and I'm the lead for uh, telecoms work uh, at, at the firm. Uh, we've done a lot of, I mean, before COVID, I used to be on a plane quite a lot to various parts of the world on telecoms projects. Uh, about 20% uh, or so of what I do is uh, advising regulators or regulated on what the regulations are or should be or should not be. And the remaining 80% is contracts to build infrastructure, share infrastructure, uh, manage infrastructure, outsource the management of networks, or provide complex telecom services. We've done a lot of work in Africa uh, recently, which I think we'll be talking about soon. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, I don't think we've managed to sort out the audio issues that uh, the State Minister, uh, Dr. Ahmedin, is currently having. Uh, but 
that notwithstanding, hopefully he'll join us uh, when uh, the issues his end uh, are resolved. But if I can turn to you, Mike, uh, and ask you to just give us, uh, as a group of panelists, but also our audience, a little bit of context for the latest developments uh, with rela in relation to subsea cables um, investments in recent times in Africa. Um, and also, if you could give look through the prism of COVID as to how those developments are being impacted or otherwise uh, by what we've seen through the pandemic and as, as well as its wider and secondary impacts, particularly the economic one. Right, thanks, Boko. So, uh, summarise the whole of um, technology uh, investment in Africa in a, in a couple of minutes, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, I've, I guess w w there's been a lot of investment in Africa, in, in particularly in the telecoms infrastructure, and a lot of innovation going on. And uh, some of that has uh, particularly African characteristics, or, or rather characteristics that, are, that are, are different from how things have happened uh, elsewhere in the world. Uh, I think um, the starting point would be submarine cables. Uh, the submarine cables, the, the fiber optic cables that connect continents is, is an area that I've been working on for more than 20 years. Uh, in fact, I'm kind of known, as, as you'll know, at the firm, Boko is the submarine cable guy. I've got maps on my wall. I've got samples on my desk uh, when I had a desk. Uh, when I wasn't, when I was uh, actually, if you can't quite see, but just there, there's another map on my wall here at home as well. Um, so, so uh, in respect of Africa, there was quite a long period where there really wasn't very much, uh, and then there was a there was a fairly short period where there was an awful lot of new construction. I'm think, thinking of cables like Ace and Wax and easy and Seacom. So they were around about 10 years ago. It was a lot of, lot of new infrastructure. Then there was a pause for a few years, but then just in the last year, there's been a lot more new cables. And there's two in particular that I think is worth mentioning. Uh, one is the Two Africa cable that Facebook and others have been um, pioneering. Uh, it's actually a system of, I think, three cables that will ultimately encircle the whole continent. It's a very ambitious project, but that, that isn't the only one. Uh, Google also has a very uh, high-profile cable on West Africa, Equiano, um, on top of which there's other um, projects that have, that have been announced or that may or may not happen. So there's been a lot of investment in submarine cables. Now, that's obviously the starting point for um, improving infrastructure and allowing more connectivity, but it's not the uh, end of the story. Um, you've also then, uh, having got your uh, capacity to the to the shoreline, you then got to bring it inland. Uh, and there's a few, there's been a few interesting investments and developments around that, um, building more fiber. So I'm sure Ben will talk to us more about what Liquid is up to, but but Liquid is, which I should mention is a client of ours, um, is, is a pioneer in uh, building fiber networks uh, around, on land around the continent. Uh, and uh, we actually helped Liquid with a deal with uh, Google actually around uh, uh, using Equiano. Um, there's also companies like C Squared, which uh, Maria may perhaps talk, tell us a bit more about. There's a Google investment along with others, uh, building more fiber investments in uh, other parts of the continent. And then um, uh, more innovative still, perhaps, or more, more, more co less common technology, there's another alphabet uh, investment, Loon, which is uh, tethering base stations from high altitude balloons and offering uh, um, improved coverage in rural areas that way. So that's those are all very exciting uh, developments on top of which there's satellite in uh, um, there's lo the low earth orbiting satellites that are being launched and there's other companies like viasat that have announced a cable that will uh, have a footprint over over much of the continent of africa so there's an awful lot of investment going in to uh, africa and and to building um improving connectivity uh, as as um in, in order to improve the the um uh, the economies and the and the uh, well-being of the people of Africa. So I think it's a very exciting time to be involved in African African tech and telecoms. Thanks, Mike. Um, like I said, I think we're still having some issues with Dr. Amidine joining, but uh, Ben, I, I, I noticed uh, Mike name-checked uh, some of the work DLA Piper have been supporting Liquid on. Um, perhaps you can just touch on uh, some of those uh, um, ad advances in, 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 and investments that Liquid have been involved in, just to give a bit of context for those who perhaps aren't aware of some of those projects that you're involved in. <clears throat> yeah, so, I mean, our... Um you know, where we have really invested the most has been in 
that uh, cable links is coming inland from landing stations into capital cities. Uh, and I think that's really, you know, we started out as a satellite company, but uh, we, we saw this opportunity when about 10 years ago when you said all these cables were being built um, and, and we didn't invest um, uh, as Liquid Telecom. We didn't invest very heavily in those cables at the time, but we, we invested very heavily to build fiber inland from the landing stations. Um, and, and we've continued to do that. Um, we, we've since uh, made acquisitions of a number of different companies uh, in East Africa and in, in South Africa. And, and by, by virtue of those acquisitions, we've, um, you know, we have become members of, of those older cables that are there. Um, and, um, you know, we, we've also become one of the largest operators of data centers uh, in the African continent. So, you know, we, we, we set out to build cable um, and not do subsea, but we, we, we're there in subsea and we have data centers and, and uh, expanding still. Uh, the, this year, you know, we, we've had a, a big achievement this year with, uh, connecting uh, South Sudan for the first time. So we've continued to roll out new fiber into new countries and we've built it to Juba, which is the, the, the first fiber there uh, and seeing huge uptake in demand. As, as every time we've connected a new country, uh, we see huge uptake in demand for the first year. Um, but yeah, as, um, as, as Mike mentioned, um, I don't think we've uh, particularly gone into full details of, of our involvement in, in Equiano, but I think it's it's in the public domain that we um, we have a license to land Equiano in, in DRC, uh, but we we are there. We, we're seeing uh, you know the opportunity of some of these new cables coming, um, of providing you know more um, heavy bandwidth uh, to connect to big markets like South Africa, uh, where where we're seeing huge demand from uh, global cloud providers, and, and uh, you know they have been investing uh, very heavily in that market. Uh, but we're also seeing uh, you know, opportunity, for particularly countries like DRC, of opening up more diversity, having more reliability, uh, and and that should bring down prices in some of the countries in West Africa where we're seeing you know, still very high prices of wholesale bandwidth. So we continue to do big projects, uh, but you know we, we are um, uh, we're also focusing more on technology and what what people can do with with those technology projects. Fantastic. Thank you, Ben. And we'll come to those innovations and advances uh, in, 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 later in the conversation. But Dr. Ahmedin, if you could unmute yourself and let's see if the audio is working OK your end. And if you could briefly just give the audience context for who you are and what you do uh, with the government of Ethiopia, please. And then um, I'll, I'll pose some questions to you. Thank you, Boko. Uh, my name is Ahmedin. I am State Minister at the Ministry of Innovation and Technology in Ethiopia, in charge of the ICT development and administration, as well as the digital transformation sector. Thank you very much. Now, now that we've got you and uh, you're, you're, you're with us, may I um, at least give you some context for Mike's initial um, uh, answers to the update uh, he gave on digital infrastructure across Africa and the various connectivity uh, uh, modes that uh, Africans are beginning to enjoy off the back of um, uh, the likes of Liquid Telecom, but also also others such as Facebook and Google um, and 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 others. Um, you in Ethiopia, um, it's big news that um, you have been uh, at state level uh, investing heavily in uh, looking to transform the digital infrastructure of the country in order to deliver services to citizens and, and, and build some level of inclusive prosperity for all in the country. Um, can you give us a little bit of an update on the Digital Ethiopia 2025 strategy, just so we can uh, anchor some of the discussion specifically to your country? Thank you. Um, the Ethiopia initiative, the Digital 2025, initiative has a lot of backgrounds. Uh, as you all know, in order not only to be competitive uh, with the rest of the world, uh, but also to guarantee a decent living for our citizen, uh, Africa in general and uh, Ethiopia uh, should increasingly use digital technologies and ICT to thereby shifting to digital economy. So this move will have a transformative impact uh, on development. The good news is that uh, Ethiopia has started the journey. I mean, Africa has also the digital transformation strategy. 
So Ethiopia has started the journey and has started to register positive achievements, positive developments in the past uh, two years. From the homegrown economic reform, we designed a, a digital transformation strategy, which is Digital Ethiopia 2025. And this Digital Ethiopia 2025 have the, 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 the plans that help us to transform the dominantly analog economy in the country to a digital economy, uh, which is an economy mainly supported by the application of digital technologies, the application of ICT infrastructure. So within this digital uh, transformation strategy, uh, we do have four pillars. One of the pillars is uh, infrastructure, infrastructure in terms of connectivity, infrastructure in terms of power. The second pillar is on electronic government services or enabling services. Uh, so within this, uh, the government of Ethiopia uh, is trying to automate all of the government services, government to citizen, government to business, business to business. All the, all the services are being uh, automated and being electronic. The third one is on uh, enabling, uh, enabling applications such as digital ID uh, and the, the digital payment. Uh, so digital ID is already on the implementation phase and uh, the digital payment, we, we already created the conducive environment to allow financial inclusion within the country, allow uh, fintechs to be part of the, this digital economy. So these are the three pillars and the fourth one, which is the most important one, is the ecosystem. The ecosystem, uh, one of the ecosystem is a regulatory. So the regulatory, uh, such as uh, Ethiopia, uh, didn't in the past, uh, in the past years, Ethiopia doesn't allow digital commerce or electronic commerce at all. So uh, we we allow the electronic commerce and by designing electronic uh, transaction proclamation, which is approved by the the House of People representative in back in June. And also the, the Startup Act is on the way and the personal data protection proclamation is also on the final track to be approved. So these are some of the regulators and creating a conducive environment in terms of the regulatory section. And the, the second part of the ecosystem is the finance. The finance, as I mentioned earlier, uh, so knowledge and uh, startups has to, has to get investment to, to change their ideas into a business, to create a wealth, to create a job in the country. And this is one of the reforms, the huge reforms in, in the past couple of months. And the final was it on people. So working on digital skills, because we need to have a digitally skilled, digitally literate uh, citizen within the country to, to use a digital infrastructure that we are going to build. So within this framework, the, 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 the Ethiopian government is trying to create innovative environments for, for, for our young uh, population, for the, the women and for the entrepreneurs within the country uh, and creating uh, a conducive environment by having different regulatory frameworks. Uh, if, if you see the current status of the, the the implementation of the digital transformation strategy. Uh, of course, Ethiopia has demonstrated rapid progress in improving connectivity when it comes to the infrastructure part. Uh, but it, it is yet to catch up with the peer nations, uh, investment in network expansion and uh, the acceleration of mobile penetration uh, has resulted in an increase in uh, internet coverage. Uh, however, the Ethiopian government is aware that uh, it has to increase the mobile subscription. Of course, there is a significant growth uh, in this, in this uh, category, but uh, Ethiopia uh, has taken steps towards inclusive connectivity. But there is still a room to improve, uh, to enable a digital economy. Poor internet access is among the top five constraints in the manufacturing sector. Manufacturing sector is one of the pathways identified in the Digital Utopia 2025. Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. Edmund.
that that's incredibly useful. I, I, I guess one of the things that some of our audience may have questions around is uh, the telco market, that being key backbone to the, the infrastructure layer. And I know Mike does a lot of work around the world, uh, including in Africa, in, in relation to regulation around um, uh, the telco market. Um, with the uh, perhaps confusion or a need for an update amongst our audience uh, the liberalization of the telco market in Ethiopia what, what's the current status as far as you can uh, share with us that's uh, public knowledge thank <clears throat> thank you Boko the current initiative uh, as part of the the Ethiopia is embarking upon a series of border reforms in the past two years uh, to accelerate the development in the, the whole the whole economy and especially in the telecom sector. So the government is considering uh, three primary reforms. The reforms are the, the various stages of the development at this time and the national telecommunication regulator, the Ethiopian Communication Authority has been set up to oversee and drive uh, this, this uh, reform. So when we, when we see the liberalization of the telecom sector, uh, I think the it is the decision to liberalize the telecom sector is one of the most visionary decisions enacted uh, by Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. Uh, until this decision, Ethiopia was one of the last three countries, along with Djibouti and Eritrea, uh, to have full government ownership over the the telecommunication service provision. Uh, when the government decided to the telecom sector, uh, it was not just long overdue, but it was out of necessity, and it is not luxury. Uh, the rationale in the perceived advantage of privatization, as well as sector liberalization, emanates from uh, some policy and board objectives. Uh, one of the objectives is to enhance the Ethiopian digital economy, the, the second is to establish a world-class telecom industry. Uh, the third one is to enhance telecommunication service accessibility and efficiency. And the fourth and the last objective is to maximize revenue from the sector for the nation, to generate a wealth, a wealth for the nation. So uh, within, within, this, within this objective, the Ethiopian government has some policy directions, the current status. Uh, one is the establishment of independent and transparent regulatory body, which is the Ethiopian Communication Authority. And the second one is the partial privatization of Ethiopia Telecom. And the third one is the, to issue new licenses to additional operators. Uh, so uh, if we see the key milestones in the implementation of the telecom sector reforms, uh, I, as I mentioned earlier, independent sector regulatory body is already established, which is the ACA. Uh, since the establishment of the ACA, different regulatory directives are developed uh, in consultation with stakeholders, huge consultation with stakeholders, about 18 directives, including the licensing, the consumer rights and the protection, the dispute resolution, the numbering, the quality of service, the infrastructure sharing and the collocation, the interconnection, the tariff, and so many regulations are in place since the establishment of the ECA within the past uh, short period of time. So for the two new telecommunication operator license issuance, a request for explanation of interest is already launched. I think uh, uh, most of you already know about it. So in addition to the process of issuing two new licenses in the liberalization process, the privatization of the ETO Telecom, which is the, the state monopoly operator is being processed simultaneously. Uh, so under the privatization schedule, asset evaluation of the, the incumbent operator is already completed. The transaction advisor for the privatization process is higher. 40% uh, of the share uh, will be made available for the international operators, 5% for the public, and the government will retain 50% of the ownership. So within this, though there were misinformation and speculations, as Boko has mentioned earlier, in different online and print medias recently, uh, that these two processes were being reported in mixed up situations, the privatization and the, the liberalization. And some even went to the extent that uh, there is a working back plan. Uh, the government of Ethiopia is 
fully committed uh, and is pursuing both liberalization and the privatization process simultaneously. The new licenses will be issued in the first quarter of 2021. The privatization process is also expected to be completed more or less uh, closer to the date the new licenses will be issued. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Dr. Ahmedin. Um, I'm going to come to you, Marianne, because uh, we've heard um, Dr. Ahmedin talk to the, a, a, a number of dimensions that are at play as a policymaker in creating uh, a context uh, that enables digital transformation, in his case, in Ethiopia. You're based in Kenya. That's a journey Kenya went through some time ago. Um, and you at Google, and specifically on the Android partnerships level, um, uh, principally involved in uh, enabling connectivity to become affordable so that the internet user in Africa can participate in uh, the digital transformation and the benefits it brings. Um, can you give us a little bit of context for where you're at uh, as an organization and if you like the stimulus you seek to uh, deploy in enabling at scale Africans to have access to the internet? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Boko. Um, so, so I, I think between Dr. Ahmedin and, and and Mike, they covered quite a lot of the basics when it comes to the infrastructure and what is required. Um, and we we've made significant progress over the years in terms of actual access, you know, in, infrastructure access, and. Um, I, as, as Mike was saying, there's been significant uh, uh, investment in Africa and that still continues, which is really great news. And what we've, as a result of that uh, significant access, I think we, we, we are seeing, I think the latest report I saw of GSMA was about a week ago, which said, we now have only about 20% of our population in Africa living without, with, you know, without actual coverage. So 80% have coverage, 20% not having having the coverage. The challenge comes um, when with with actual internet access, access number one, and number two, usage. Um, and the reason why that challenge is there is is a number of things, and there's a number of barriers for that. Um, you know, 3G has been built across the continent of Africa. 4G has also been built. I think we're almost around 70% 4G coverage around the continent now. Um, when it comes to the challenge of internet access, we access the internet primarily via mobile broadband and mobile devices. And the barrier of having those mobile devices in the hands of users and businesses is that of price. Um, yeah, affordability of mobile phones and affordability of data. It's a bit of a chicken and egg situation because the less mobile phones or smartphones we have in the hands of people, you know, the less we can address the, the, the pricing to the best possible way we, we can because of the economies of scale. So from a Google perspective and specifically Android, um, our role has, you know, and our objective has always been to put the power of computing in everybody's hands as equitably as possible. That's why we've built the Android ecosystem. Today, I think it's the largest uh, operating system of, of, of mobile devices in the world. We have over 2.6 billion um, users on the Android ecosystem. And specifically for Android, we don't necessarily, you know, Android addresses the entire value chain. It's not only for high-end devices. You'll get high-end devices but of course you'll also get um, the more affordable affordable devices um, in 2018 we we went a step further with Android what what we did was we we, we enhanced the Android ecosystem to run on the least demanding hardware possible while still giving full-fledged smartphone experience. So not smart feature phone experience, but full-fledged smartphone experience. So as an ecosystem, that's a step that we took. And the idea of taking that step was to ensure that we have as many people as possible digitally, digitally you know, included in the digital world. Because we know the more people who are included uh, in the digital economies, the better it is for the countries and the continent of Africa and indeed the world. We know the significance it has on GDP. Um, and during COVID, I think um, it has really proven if you don't have that digital access, unfortunately, you're cut off. You're cut off from education. You're cut off from economic opportunities. You're cut off from you know, not being able to reach loved ones. Um, and, and you're cut off from the information that is being exchanged by, you know, 
uh, around the world on the on the, on the health 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 um, health risks that are that are going on. So, what do we do in terms of addressing those barriers? I think number one, from a Google perspective, it is refining that Android ecosystem and ensuring that it's running on 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 the least demanding hardware, so that we can bring the pricing down, and ensuring that we have as many people taking part in the ecosystem as possible. We know that competition is great. You know, when you have so many OEMs uh, or original, you know, the manufacturers uh, taking on Android, it does, you know, get you know, people, um, oh, sorry, organizations competing fairly to ensure that they bring quality devices to the market, refining their distribution, ensuring they have great partnerships. But that's not where it stops for us. I mean, we 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 can only meet our mission um, of, of, of putting the power of computing in, in everybody's hands equitably if we have the right partnerships and the right partnerships with telecommunication providers, with OEM manufacturers, with retailers and the likes. When it comes specifically to telecommunication um, service providers, I think you may have seen um, we've gone a step further with the Android ecosystem where we've developed the capability uh, of, of, of the operating system helping um, or supporting organizations such as carriers or retailers or manufacturers to be able to drive um, smart de device financing. So we developed the technology, the organizations obviously create the initiatives and programs to drive uh, drive device financing. We know that being able to pay the what price once off is is a challenge in our, in, in our continent. So how about we, I mean, we, we know what we did with pro, prepaid. I mean, this is primarily a prepaid continent. Why don't we use that same approach to, um, to, to, to dr device acquisition um, whereby a user or can pay a certain a nominal fee per day. Um, in the case of we, we launched with Safaricom in, in Kenya, it's 20 cents per day. You know, 20 cents is what we pay for for those people in the audience who know what Sukuma Wiki is. It's a staple diet in Kenya, which is I guess in English is it kale, boko? I think it's kale or greens, colored greens. Yeah. 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 Your greens, greens, exactly. That's the staple diet of every home, whether it's the low income homes, medium income or high income homes, that is a staple diet. So, you know, to be able to get a device at that price, of course, allows, um, uh, you know, brings on affordability to many people who didn't have access. And, you know, they, 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 they Safaricom in particular were very, very smart because they went specifically for 4G devices, high quality 4G devices, and made the upfront investment to be able to distribute those devices to, to, to the, the, you know, the people who are missing out or the, or population who are missing out on that 4G access. So um, in addition, I think um, it's not only the devices side of things, but uh, we, we also, for those who are already covered, we know that another barrier on internet usage is that of digital education. So we need to partner as an ecosystem to ensure that our population, uh, our customers and consumers have not only access to the device, but access to the digital skills that can help them get the best usage out of out of these devices, and for that we partner with uh, manufacturers again um, in ensuring that we have retail presence, folks who can help customers come online, get get the best out of the devices. Similar thing with carriers as well, and and, and the direct channel of carriers, the ret retailers. We also have we partner on ensuring that we have presence in those retail stores to educate. Um, uh, folks on how to get the best out, out of their devices. Um, and recently we also, actually not recently, it's just the latest version that launched uh, earlier this month. Um, we've also partnered with the GSMA Association on something we call the MIST program, um, which distributes and disseminates information both digitally and physically to carriers, consumers, uh, OEM uh, manufacturers on digital skills as well. So they've created a specific package on digital skills and training. And that's another area we, we, we work on together. Um, but we, in, in addition to that, I think um, Mike had mentioned quite a few, uh, I'm not going to repeat them, but of quite a few things that Google is doing around affordability, you know, in the case of putting Equiano in place, which is, you know, on the West Coast of Africa, it comes all the way from Portugal down the West Coast into 
around S South Africa, uh, with several stop points along the way, all in, 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 in the name of driving efficiency and affordability. You know, um, so those are just some of the things that we're doing to drive affordability um, and access and inclusion uh, into the digital economy. Because the more people we have um, partaking in the digital economy, the more benefits we have for our population, and of course, the more impact it has on on, on the GDP growth of the continent of Africa. Thanks, Miriam. Uh, a comprehensive view of uh, how affordability is uh, vitally important on the continent. Um, ben, if I could draw you into the conversation um, there. Uh, uh, Mariam uh, talked eloquently about a number of things Google are doing. Clearly, you are in the business of connecting people on the continent. And no doubt you will have had experience in this last half a year or so of doing so at a time when it was utterly necessary. Um, and thinking here about the impact of COVID. And I know you've got some, some instances and examples of where liquid really made, made a difference to, to people's lives on the continent off the back of COVID. Can you talk, talk to some of those? I was thinking particularly around education, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, um, it's been an interesting, um, interesting few months, put it that way. And, um, you know, we've seen... Uh, a whole different area of you know a number of areas of of the digital economy that uh, Dr. Amadin was talking about you know taking off um, and, and particularly starting with with e-commerce so so you know immediately that um, that you know people working from home people started using e-commerce for much more wider variety of things but um, you know this is a uh, this is the positive step forward um, and and we we've seen ever see you know people are actually participating more in in doing these online video conferences that have become the new normal and just normal day-to-day -day meetings uh, and that's had a, a really big effect on on the uptake of bandwidth on on the networks that we've built um, but you know just as as Mariam has been depicting it's it's really in the area of education that we've seen the the digital divide really exposed um, so so much because um, we have in Nairobi we have private schools um, and some of them, you know, are, are, have been doing almost full-time lessons, um, and you know they've got high-speed infrastructure, high-speed broadband directly to the school, uh, and they're able to do those, um, you know, th those lessons online. And the the, the, the people, are, the children who are attending those schools, in the main, um, you know, they will be having uh, fast broadband or having, uh, you know, 4G access um, or fibre to the home, and they've got devices where they can access those lessons. So. Um, they've both been you know, doing lessons and and having a large number of children that can can access lessons. Now we are pretty busy, um, you know, uh, working quite hard to connect uh, schools across Africa. And uh, you know, one uh, big project we've done in Kenya is we've connected about 300 schools uh, as part of the Universal Service Fund. But we've done about 5,000 in South Africa as well. So it, it's overall, um, you know, we, we've done a small fraction of the schools. That are available to connect, um, but you know, part of our work is is working with governments and stakeholders to to encourage um, you know the, the need for broadband. Now, uh, before COVID, we were working with uh, we were working with schools to that we connected to help them use you know um, internet more in the classroom. Uh, but since COVID, you know, we've managed to partner with um, you know a number of of global and local technology companies, including Microsoft, Cisco. Uh, Kenik, the, the domain registry of Kenya, and a few uh, edutech companies here, uh, and Gaza Elimu is one, but there's a few others we're working with. So we've been uh, helping the teachers at the schools that we'd already connected use the internet in the other way around. So we've been, first of all, we, we started teaching them how to uh, how to do these online Zoom lessons, and we were using Microsoft Teams, but uh, we were helping them to deliver classes um, that way, but we have others using Google Classroom as well. We have uh, we've been teaching them those skills they need. We've been getting them the the, the internet domains that they, that they need. Getting a lot of free offers from some of these technology companies that we work with, um, and you know, giving them training on how to run school networks. So we've managed to see them actually. Um, you know, although schools have been closed and they're, they're, they're public schools, they've got no obligation to do any online learning. Uh, no one's paying any fees for it. You know, the, the number of the teachers that, that are working at the schools we've got connected just out of their own. You know uh, their own spirit really have been um, getting on and and delivering online lessons. You know so, uh, but 
the challenge we've seen is that um, that just as Mariam said, you know, not many people having um, not enough people having access to devices that they can lend to their children, not enough people being able to afford the data. So even those teachers that have been doing, um, you know, the, the, the form of grade um, form four, form three classes, they've been doing them online. They've only been seeing about 30 to 40 percent attendance uh, from those from the public school children. But there's, you know, the one uh, we, we did support one uh, school who just set up in a farmhouse. You know, he, he, he set up in a farmhouse to deliver this online school and he was trying to use you know, mobile phones to do this. And ultimately, you know, you can't you can't scale. Um, you, you can. Yes, you can use a mobile phone for doing a video call, uh, but you can't scale and have, you know, 30 teachers in one room all using uh, mobile phones or using the same tower. Uh, at the same time, there's just not enough uplink bandwidth. So we were unable to we were able to get them connected to high speed fiber. But there's a there's a lot needs to be done. Um, but we you know also you know, that area is going to um, it's not going to be the same again. Education is going to be changed for forever. Um, and and I think the other area of of digital transformation that we're going to see is being really rapid is going to be in healthcare. Uh, so COVID has exposed you know the weaknesses in uh, in, in in public and and uh, um, and private healthcare, but it's also exposed. I uh, will also say it's also highlighted the the importance of data, the importance of uh, you know data driven healthcare systems, and, and you know the countries that have been doing the most uh, you know well here have been uh, collecting data, daily reporting of data, and, and using ICT systems for this. So we're going to see across the whole continent a very very big investment. In, in healthcare, uh, which is also going to drive a need for investment of local cloud services. So it's 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 been an interesting time, um, but you know it, it, I, I say that it's kickstarted the the digital economy, but it, it's been it's been going for a while here in Kenya, and I think Ethiopia, um, you know, it, it, they're doing a lot to try and um, you know um, I guess rewind ten or fifteen years of history that uh, in in the next five years, which is great uh, because I think you know. Those are the things that need to happen that the, that the minister has, uh, has described. So it's exciting times. Indeed, exciting times. And uh, and now is the time to be discussing it, given uh, uh, the hundreds of people that have joined us that are interested in Africa and tech, irrespective of where they sit in the world. Um, it's interesting, over the course of the last couple of uh, discussions in this panel, there's a couple of questions that have come up about uh, scaling tech. Um, a couple of questions around smart city propositions. Uh, one particular question suggesting that MNOs have 4G networks that are underused and whether we need 5G. Now, I, I think in, in, in thinking through how to enable digital transformation at state level or with the private sector or for consumers, um, ultimately there comes a time when you realize that not everybody is getting onto those digital platforms at the rate perhaps one would anticipate. Yet if they did, for example, you mentioned the hundreds of schools in Kenya, if it was all the schools in Kenya, uh, the, the necessary bandwidth and capacity would be enormous. Now, if, if one's going to go into that direction in the future where you have driverless cars, everybody's healthcare data on the cloud, et cetera, et cetera, um, have we got the capacity? Do we need that capacity? Should we continue investing in that capacity if folk aren't necessarily um, joining at scale? Any any thoughts, perhaps, from you, Ben, initially? Um, yeah. So, um, you know, we are in a mobile-first economy, and um, you know, it's 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 good that um, it's great, by the way, that, that we've got these things of, of you know financing um mobile phones now that uh, marion has been talking about and uh but you know a mobile phone is not the only digital device you're ever you, you're, you're going to own it's probably it's possibly for some it's going to be the first digital device they're going to own um but you know for me i've probably got over 40 connected devices in in, in the home here and you know including music system even uh, even my washing machine can i don't think i use it but it can connect to wi-fi and, and tell me about washing cycles you know um, so, uh, you know, it, it's, w w if we, if we get to a stage where we have fully, um, digital lives, if we have fully digitized, uh, healthcare, digital education, uh, digital cities, you know, the bandwidth is going to be absolutely enormous, um, that's going to be required and, and it's not going to be enough, uh, you know, 4G won't be enough and, and even 5G won't be enough to deliver 
all of those things if we are truly living in in that level of of, of digital uh, you know um, digital economy but what we what we've seen um in as we've built networks across uh, the continent we've seen that um certain cities have evolved as as, as hubs of interconnectivity and hubs of data and then this is where um, you know a lot of the global companies that, that are the big giants of the internet have come uh, with with points of presence with with caching devices so we're seeing that places like Johannesburg Cape Town Nairobi uh, Lagos is emerging we're seeing these cities as being you know really big hubs of where the data is concentrating it's not all coming from Europe um, and this is interesting from you know as Ethiopia opens up um, you know, Ethiopia is, is currently having all of its internet really um, coming from Djibouti as being a gateway to Europe or even a gatekeeper to Europe even. It might be, you know, holding back the digital economy uh, so far. But, you know, to the south, um, it, it's going on. And, and, and Kenya is having uh, a lot of innovation, a lot of tech companies emerging out of Kenya. With the Africa Free Trade Agreement, um, you know, the, and the infrastructure that is in the region already, the interconnectivity of Africa is going to is going to have a really big influence on 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 where the traffic is flowing, and, and we're seeing that eighty percent of our internet that's being consumed in Africa is coming from within Africa, um, and that's including the contributions. As I say the global tech giants have come um, have come with with points of presence on the continent, uh, but we're seeing that that is happening, and um, you know this is going to um, you know. As more countries come in line, we said South Sudan's come into the digital economy, Ethiopia is coming in, we'll see more concentration, more innovation going on. Um, there is a, you know, the last mile uh, issue is going to require much more fiber, and that's what we strive to do on infrastructure level. We'll keep on building fiber to serve the needs of 5G and uh, other technologies, as well as uh, fiber directly to serve to people's houses. Thanks, Ben. Um, Dr. Agmedin, would you like to? Um, add to anything Ben has said in relation to the, the innovations you're anticipating, uh, the digital strategy in Ethiopia unlocking uh, for, for consumers. And, and Mike, just to prepare you, there's a question that's just come in regarding, uh, and I'll read it directly, what are the main insights on the legal side about structuring deals in connectivity um, in the telco space? It's a fairly broad question, but I'll give you a bit of time to think through what uh, key insights you might share in your experience, of which I know you have much in relation to structuring such deals. But um, uh, Dr. Ahmedin, innovations in Ethiopia, um, at startup level, uh, if there's entrepreneurs who have joined us and they're listening in to you and will no doubt know you, um, where, where, where do you see next, the next three years in Ethiopia um, uh, providing opportunities to unlock some of that innovation that human talent always brings? Thank you, Boko. Uh, I think when you talk about the innovation, it is, it is one of the phases in a technological change. It starts from the idea. Idea grows to innovation, and uh, innovation is a product and a service, uh, solving a problem of the community. So uh, scaling and diffusing such kinds of innovation is very important. So the current uh, situation in Ethiopia, uh, there are a lot of innovation in everywhere, within the office, within the community. So a lot of innovation, innovative ideas are coming up. When you come to the business or uh, business ideas that that are going to solve the the problem of the public, uh, the problem of the government. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are we are developing a startup act. Uh, it is on the final track to be approved. Uh, so this startup act has has a lot of uh, opportunities, incentives for venture capitalists, for angels and networkers, those who are going to invest on such kinds of startups, as well as uh, those who are coming up with the idea, uh, innovative ideas uh, and innovative products. So the the environment and the the, it is part of the digital Ethiopia 2025. So creating a conducive environment. So uh, we think very big actually. So we we think very big. We start with small and we are scaling it fast. I think that is that is one part of the the innovation. From the I think uh, I said earlier, 
digital infrastructure includes quite a lot of elements uh, and one is connectivity uh, for sure so strong connectivity is very crucial uh, to digital economy uh, and other digital products and services are dependent on seamless and equitable access to internet for the operation so when our prime minister initiated this digital economy uh, initiative within ethiopia uh, it includes public welfare services such as e-governance, the emerging business models such as e-commerce. Uh, the, on the other hand, lack of connectivity can be, of course, a strong barrier. But the Ethiopian government, as I mentioned, is working on the telecom privatization, the telecom liberalization uh, process, and it is, it is going very well. Uh, I, I have seen one question raised from the related to interoperability. Interoperability is very critical and important nowadays because there are a lot of a different kinds of technologies are coming up and uh, making them interoperable to for as of uh, usage by the consumer is very important. So Ethiopia, uh, Ethiopia has an ambitious again plan on improving EODB, ease of doing business. So the way you start a business in Ethiopia, the way you pay tax in Ethiopia, the way you register a property in Ethiopia, and different things are, are, are part of the initiative. So the prime minister is following it aggressively on EODB ranking. So we can see the interoperability issue at part of this. Different banks are being interoperable to each other on the payment platform. Uh, and as, as, as a regulatory and policy ministry, we designed a enterprise architecture and interoperability framework which will be actually approved soon and will be implemented throughout the government organization that was one of the biggest challenge in ethiopia thank you dr Agbedin. um mike on the structuring of the deals um and also mariam if you could come in on this because i appreciate you're uh, heavily involved in uh, structuring partnerships um structuring deals legal side Mike, key insights? <laughs> thanks, Boko. Um, I, 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 thanks for the heads up that you're going to ask me. So I, I've, I've dotted down a few thoughts that, that might uh, go some way to answering the question. Um, what, what I think is uh, the unusual features of uh, uh, telecoms deals uh, as distinct from other type uh, or many other types of, of projects are in most cases you're going to sink an, hundreds of millions of dollars or you know large amounts of money in assets that that will have a long payback period and that can't be moved very easily and so that means you need to think about the longer term risks around that so i got three kind of thoughts uh, 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 as to as a consequence and on things that you should think that an investor looking at investing in telco connectivity in africa should think about and, and this is and uh, things that make that are particularly acute for for, for all the telecom side i should have just thought of a fourth hang on um although the two of them are related to one another okay so so the first one in, in no particular order is um is there a bilateral investment treaty between the country where you're investing and your country. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, uh, there are a number of treaties between uh, uh, nation states which offer protection to investors. And that is a guard against uh, an expropriation of your assets or some other uh, behavior by the government, which could be years later, it could be a different government, um, which might undermine the value of your investment or undermine the premises on which it was made. Uh, I think that is a very important protection. So, you know, you know, or you've got a lot more confidence if there's a BIT, a bilateral investment treaty in place, that your assets aren't going to be expropriated or undermined. Um, and if there were, you'd have a remedy, you'd have a legal remedy you can bring. There's a, a proceedings you can bring the government to for, for doing that. So, um, for example, uh, we there have been a number of uh, telecoms BIT um, uh, cases actually to, to do with taxes being imposed on telecoms infrastructure or nationalizations without proper compensation or uh, uh, what well, one case I can think of it, it, which involved Africa was um, uh, a government minister uh, claimed that that his government wasn't bound by a contract that his predecessor government had signed uh, because that he said uh, the new minister said that the the person signing the old contract was the wrong was the wrong person so it's these kind of um, shenanigans that, that a, a bilateral investment treaty can can help um, guard against that's the first thing to think about 
the second thing in the telecom sector in particular is regulation. Uh, regulation is really important. We haven't talked all that much about it, actually, but I think it, um, g getting regulation right is, is extremely important to attract new investment. If you're going to build a new entrant to an incumbent, um, and as we'll see in Ethiopia, um, you know that's where exactly that's we've just heard that's exactly the situation. There's going to be two new licenses. If you want to encourage investment and and competition, which in the end is competition that that will benefit end users, uh, then the investors, private investors, need to know what the regulatory system is. They need to know that they're going to have a fair, a fair and independent regulator, and they need to know that they're going to have regulated access on predictable and foreseeable terms to the network infrastructure that's already there. So, so I'm pleased to hear from uh, Dr. Ahmedin that the regulation has been a, getting the regulation right has been um, a priority because I think that's a, that's a critical success factor. Um, w without which it's much much more difficult. Uh, we're acting in another country actually at the moment in Africa, uh, where there's a lot less. For, for a potential investor in building a new network where they're struggling as a result of the lack of clarity around regulation. So I think that's the second thing that's really important. The third thing, just a kind of a little tip, can I, actually. Um, can I ask you to be really sorry, mother, quick, I'm, Mike? Because I'm conscious I need to right, give sorry. Marianne one minute and, and you've got one minute. Okay, third thing, very quickly, um, arbitration. If you get into a dispute with a private party, um, uh, especially if, if you're the foreign investor in a, in a telecoms asset and there's a there's a local party you're in a dispute with you you'll uh, in, in many countries around the world you might not have much confidence in the local courts and even if you do have confidence in the local courts it might be difficult to enforce a local judgment overseas uh, an arbitration process is much easier to enforce usually is something you've got more certainty about and there are more treaties around the world on the reciprocal enforcement of arbitration awards so choose arbitration for dispute resolution rather than local courts that was my third and final thought thank you very much mike uh, and the question did demand the legal side uh, and you gave it there mariam on the commercial side one minute wow, wow. I'm, I'm so glad that i don't have to do the legal side because it all sounds too technical and too legal um on the partnership side my, my side is pretty easy what is it we can all do to mutual, you know, serve the user, the end user, because it makes good business sense for all of us if we have the right business, uh, sorry, if we have the right partnerships in place that serve the end user, right? Um, any partnership we, we put in place has to be mutually, it has to be beneficial to the end user, work backwards, and then for the partner we work with, which is in this case, carriers, OEM partners, retailers, and, and, and the likes, and then obviously, towards the other side is that should all serve somewhere around, you know, what, what does Google get, get out of this as well? And for us, it's really making sure that um, folks have access, universal access to, to, to technology. Uh, and if they can use the tools that we provide, the digital tools we provide, that's pretty good. But I want to chime in on something real quick, um, uh, uh, Boko, if you don't mind. I think there was a question asked about 4G. Do we really need 5, 5G? Um, I just wanted to share with you one of, one of my mentors used to always always say, have the binoculars in one eye, the microscope in the other. Microscope meaning we got to make 4G work. We got to make sure that it's, 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 it's working for all of us, but we cannot miss out on the you know, 5G trends that are happening as well. Otherwise, we leave innovation behind. So we've got to we've got to do both, perhaps in different varying efforts. Um, but in my mind, we, we, we definitely have to do definitely have to do both. Thank you very much, Mariam. And uh... We've run out of time, unfortunately. So let me just say thank you very much to you, Mariam. Thank you very much, Dr. Akhmedin. Thank you very much, Ben. And thank you very much, Mike, for joining us. Conscious that the team want to move on to the next session. Do remember, should you want to speak to any of the DLA Piper folk, do join us in our booth in the exhibition space. But we've heard with connectivity, with cables, and with digital infra infrastructure in the round, there's a number of important things that we need to consider, not least the policy level con considerations, the partnerships that are integral to making this all work, how products are critical to fueling in innovation, and how people and their literacy around digital is very important. And finally, on the in in interoperability side of things, performance of all of this investment and all of this these products and services is crucial for the consumer to enjoy a seamless experience and continue to use um, what's on the digital infrastructure layer but to my speakers thank you very much it's been a delight working with you and i hope the audience enjoyed listening to those eminent speakers over to you 
Africa Tech Summit team. Thank you.